Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay, welcome everybody. We're going to get started. Uh, welcome to the Global Development Policy Center. Um, my name is Kevin Gallagher. I'm the director of the center. We're a new center here at Boston University. Uh, just started in September. We had a whole bunch of seminars last semester, and if you came into this room and it looks a little different, uh, that's true. We usually have a seminar table in here, but uh, Frank Ackerman's talk was oversubscribed, so at the last minute we had to experiment with uh, amphitheater style. Seems like we can, we can fit everybody in. Um, we're excited to be a, a new center here on campus. Our mission is to advance policy-oriented research on financial stability, human well-being, and environmental sustainability across the globe. And we have three inaugural research initiatives here at the center. Uh, one of them is called the Land Use and Livelihoods Initiative. It looks at uh, international institutions, domestic policies, and other drivers of land use change and its impact, impacts on people across the world. Another one's called the Human Capital Initiative that looks at education and human health in developing countries. And the third one is called the Global Economic Governance Initiative, which looks at international institutions like the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and, and those institutions in and around the trading system and their impacts on development across the globe. And so you'll, uh, you'll be seeing a lot of uh, events that we're having on these issues. We're having a seminar series this semester called the Global Economic Governance seminar uh, and the first one is next Tuesday uh, here at 12.30 lunchtime and it's by Professor Eileen Grable from Denver, University of Denver and she's going to be talking about her new book with MIT Press called When Things Don't Fall Apart and it's her take of uh, the international financial system after the financial crisis. Uh, free lunch for that one and we'll have a whole bunch of those uh, across, across the semester. Um, you'll also probably next week get an invite for our big inaugural ceremony on February 28th where Secretary, former Secretary General Ban Ki-moon will give a keynote address and will really celebrate uh, the beginning of the new, the, the new center. So keep your eyes open for that. Uh, I should say in addition to welcoming all of you, the reason why I have a microphone is not because uh, I'm soft spoken. That's not one of the criticisms I usually get. But it's to uh, welcome folks who are uh, watching via the web and we'll take some questions from you uh, as well. Um, this is a, we've done a number of events, but this is our first event on climate change this semester, and we thought it would be wrong to have an event on climate change without partnering with two of the other centers here on campus that have been doing climate change work for a long time. So this uh, event today is co-sponsored with the Party Center for the Study of the Longer Range Future. Cynthia Bearcat and some others are, are here from the center. Uh, they've been working on climate change for a long time, and in fact, I think they hosted uh, a book talk for one of Frank's other books on climate change uh, four, or five, four or five years ago. It's also um, co-sponsored with the Institute for Sustainable Energy, uh, which is also a new center on campus that was started last year by Peter Fox Penner, which looks at uh, sort of business solutions and technological so solutions for clean energy uh, in the United States and abroad. So we're really excited to be partnering with both of these centers uh, on this and, and imagine partnering with you folks on, on issues around climate change uh, and other issues over the course of uh, our, our long, hopefully long futures. Um, really excited to kick off this semester with a talk uh, with Dr. Frank Ackerman to celebrate and hear about his new book called Worst Case Economics, Extreme Events in Climate and Finance, um, which I've got, he has some copies here that he'd be willing to uh, uh, share with you for a fee after his talk. Um, Frank is, uh, I've had the opportunity and the, and, the, and the privilege of knowing Frank Ackerman for a, for a long time and I, I, I hang out with economists more than I should and I have to say he's definitely the most interesting and innovative environmental economist alive. Uh, he has been doing such uh, innovative work for an incredible career and there's no sign of, uh, of stopping. Uh, 
Uh, I'm going I'm to read parts of his long bio because I want him to be able to give a talk. Um, but he's got a BA in mathematics and economics from Swarthmore, and a, after serving two years as a conscientious objector during the Vietnam War, he entered graduate school and got a PhD in economics at Harvard in the 1970s. He was the founder of Dollars and Cents magazine, which I uh, encourage you to take a look at. It's a, um, it's sort of, it's a, not no longer a weekly, but it's sort of a, a good pairing with The Economist magazine of reporting on economic issues in the United States abroad. Um, for a long time, uh, he was uh, an economist and analyst at the TELUS Institute, where he studied the economics of energy and solid waste recycling from 1985 to 1995. And then f from 1995 to 2007, where I got a chance to know him the most, is when he was an economist and the director of the research and policy program at the Global Development and Environment Institute at Tufts University and the Fletcher School of uh, Law and Diplomacy. And then from 2007 to 2012, he went to the Stockholm Environment Institute, where he was the head of the climate economics team. And since 2012, he's been at Synapse Energy Economics, uh, teaching at Tufts University, teaching at MIT. And we were lucky last year to have him as a senior fellow here, where he uh, did a study on the impacts of, um, of job, uh, renewable energy, cl uh, climate change, and jobs in the United States. Um, in addition to his day job and all this exciting stuff that he does, uh, he's also a trumpet player in the Second Line Social Aid and Pleasure Society bra Brass Band, um, which I encourage you to check out at places like Riles and, and, uh, and lots, of, uh, lots of outdoor activities when it's nicer uh, in the summertime. You can see these folks at festivals all over town. They're, they're, a, they're a real trip, literally and figuratively. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Frank and, and have him to come up here and, and present the snapshot of his new book. Um, I've asked him to talk for a little bit. I'd, uh, I'd appreciate, we'd all appreciate if you uh, limit your questions during his talk to anything that's just clarifying. And then after that, we can open up for question and answer and a discussion with Frank. And also with those of you who are on the web, we can take some, po uh, take some answers, questions and answers from you as well. So please help me in, uh, in uh, welcoming Frank Ackerman to the center. Yeah, I think. Thank you. Uh, this is a book that I was working on for the better part of the last four years, which came out of technical work I was doing about climate economics, uh, in which I ended up working with an economist who insisted that there were very strong parallels between the economics of climate change and the economics of finance an idea which had never occurred to me. I never studied finance and never thought I was going to find it as interesting as I have. Uh, so I wrote one technical article about that, and the attempt to write a second one somehow just gradually turned into this book over the course of a few years. So um, John Maynard Keynes was thoughtful enough to explain what the book was about decades before it was written. Uh, economists set themselves too easy, too useless a task if in tempestuous seasons they can only tell us that when the storm is long past, the ocean is flat again. Uh, it's as apt today and as it was then, and that is exactly what this is about. So let me begin in the middle of the story uh, to give you a sense of what do I mean by extreme events and what's the economic problem of how to think about extreme events. Uh, is your house likely to burn down next year? Well, the answer is absolutely not. Uh, I did this simple calculation, looked at the number of residential fires reported to fire departments in the United States and divided by the number of housing units in the United States. And you get a ratio of 1 to 360. That says that the average house has a fire every 360 years, a little longer than you're going to live there. Um, by far, the most likely number of fires you'll encounter in your life is zero, and the probability of having one next year is in the low tenths of a percent. So, you know, we have more than 99% confidence that you don't need to spend that money on fire insurance. Uh, why not cancel it, spend it on something else that you'll like better? This will turn out to be a great way to raise your standard of living in every year when you don't have a fire. Uh, which is why people buy fire insurance, because the risk, uh, although it only happens occasionally, is too great to ignore. 
it's hard to come up with equally exact numbers, but it's very much in the same range if you say, what's the probability that young parents who buy life insurance need that life insurance next year? The probability of the death of a young parent is similar to possibly a little lower than the probability of a house fire next year. Again, cancel your life insurance, spend the money on something that your kids actually need, and you'll be much better off in every year when you don't die. Uh, so these are extreme events which are far from likely. They are far from the thing you'd bet money on. In fact, it, you know, the conventional standard of 95% confidence, we're way beyond 95% confidence that they're not happening. We have more than 99% confidence that you don't need your fire insurance, that the typical young parent doesn't need their life insurance next year. Um, so to look a little more at extremes, first in climate and then in finance, a lot of it has to do with things changing too fast. So how fast can temperatures change? We have these wonderful reconstructions from the Greenland ice cores of what the temperatures have been in the past. And this is 20,000 years of history of the temperature from those ice cores. And um, this is the ice age very sudden end to the ice age, and then shortly thereafter, equally sudden collapse into an episode called the Younger Dryas. Dryas is an alpine wildflower, which normally grows at very high altitudes. And for this period in Europe, it was found all over the place at low altitudes, and then went back up the mountains. And that this was the first evidence since corroborated that there was this incredibly cold period so we have three rapid swings coming out of the Ice Age into the Younger Dryas, out of the Younger Dryas. In each of these, the temperature changed at more than five degrees Celsius, nine degrees Fahrenheit per century for more than a century. Uh, one of them had changed at that rate for two centuries in a row. And five degrees Celsius temperature change is a huge change. Uh, Boston plus five degrees gets you down to Raleigh, North Carolina. Boston minus five degrees gets you up uh, in Millinock at Baxter State Park, the interior of northern Maine. Uh, Illinois plus five degrees gets you to Arizona. London plus five degrees gets you to Barcelona. Uh, these are changes that I think it's impossible to picture a human society, certainly agriculture, a lot of infrastructure adapting to in a century, particularly since we don't know as it's happening what the destination is. Now this, the last 10,000 years here, is remarkably stable. And this temperature stability for 10,000 years is what gave rise to agriculture, cities, modern medicine, Facebook and Twitter, uh, all the rest. Uh, this kind of temperature stability made it possible. And in the last 10,000 years, there's not great evidence of these kind of rapid temperature changes, but the previous 10,000 years tell a story of push the climate far enough and it will change faster than human society can cope with. Here on a very different time scale is a somewhat similar story about stock prices. I spent some time working on this, playing with the S&P 500 index. I downloaded 64 years of daily data, which I'll talk more about in a minute. And this is the daily percentage changes in two years. So this is 2006 at the height of the subprime real estate, et cetera, bubble. Uh, almost every day it changed less than 1% up or down. The market was going up. There's a little bit more above the line than below, but that's not really what you see here. You see absolute consistency. Well, with price changes like this, everyone's a genius. Why not go into day trading? Uh, of course you'll make money. And then what a difference two years makes. In 2008, the great majority of days saw more than a 1% price change up or down, and some saw 9 to 11% changes. Uh, here, you're more or less guaranteed to lose your shirt. And you can see on this September when Lehman Brothers collapsed and we entered the full-on crisis. You can, it just jumps out at you. But it was not a smooth ride even before that. It was already a little crazy. Um, first time I did this talk, someone in the audience pointed out that 
right now it looks even flatter than 2006. Uh, and uh, a topic I'm not going to discuss today is does that mean that we're again at the end of one of these speculative bubbles? So figure that out for yourself. Uh, they, they never tell you in advance. That's one of the <laughs> themes here. Uh, so let me go back to the beginning now of the story. I start with looking at how does conventional economics end up leading us away from understanding these extremes? Why is it only talking about when the storm is long past? And modern economics in the form that uh, we have all enjoyed or suffered uh, emerged quite suddenly in the 1870s, essentially simultaneously developed in three or four places in the early 1870s. It was one of the great mysteries of intellectual history of how did people in different countries speaking different languages were not in touch with each other at all, come up with essentially these same kind of formulations, supply and demand and marginal cost, and marginal revenue and so on. Um, it's 20 years too early to be a response to Marxism. Marxism wasn't uh, famous yet. Uh, 20 years later, you can talk about was economics being defensive about Marxist or populist challenges, not in the 1870s. I think that what was going on is that the intellectual commu community of those times was heavily influenced by physics, which seemed like one of the great intellectual successes of the era. And one of the curious things that confirmed this for me is that during the four years when I was writing this, there were times when I was stuck and uh, I finally achieved this other personal goal of reading War and Peace. And uh, it, was, uh, it was striking how much he was talking about the prestige of physics. I mean, this was written at about the same time, 1869. It's you know, just a few years before this birth of modern economics. And he talks about analogies from physics, you know, that how could you think that the strength of an army was just in its numbers? That's like thinking that momentum was the same thing as mass. And you had to multiply it by something else. And he talks about a soldier in battle being subject to the parallelogram of forces on you know, the long thing at the end about ignoring the laws of history is like imagining that uh, the Earth is the center of the universe and isn't affected by other forces. And, uh, you know, so if a novelist who's thinking about war and history could do that much with physics, imagine what economists who are thinking about mathematical models of behavior could do. Uh, this was a time when physics was a, a lot about equilibrium events, about uh, movements near equilibrium. And one of the things they imply, which I'm going to come to in a minute, is that random events around equilibrium are well described by the bell curve. And that means that extreme events are very rare. I'm, I'm sure you've all seen the bell curve. and not sure if you've thought about the fact that it means that there's almost no probability of things getting very extreme, if that's a good description of randomness. Uh, the analogy as you think about it, it seems to me to just jump out. Gas particles collide, exchange energy, and reach equilibrium. Buyers and sellers meet, exchange goods and money, and we imagine reach economic equilibrium. Uh, kind of hits you in the face. There, so there are other problems with this theory which affect this story, in which I write about briefly. Which, um, I'm trying to move on and not repeat the things that I've written about before, so there's a lot of a lot of important things like the discount rate, which will not show up today. Uh, there's the story of homo economicus, the antisocial, perfectly informed and rational behavior. There's the assumption that it's safe to ignore environmental externalities and monopoly power. And it, there's a, a chapter summarizing each of those, but I, that's not what I want to talk about today. I, I want to talk about this image of randomness. And so. Uh, you can find anything on the internet these days. That's a picture of Brownian motion um, that, uh, you know, seeds of pollen in the original story that you could see in a microscope were jiggling all the time because they were struck by something smaller, which is eventually figured out to be water molecules. And um, Einstein actually used this in a famous 1905 paper to deduce the size of water molecules. Louis Bachelier, who was part of the same world of thinking about this wonderful new model, proposed this as a model of the stock market, the Paris Stock Exchange. He thought was, you know, there were little random events striking company valuations all the time. Prices go up, prices go down, 
a little war here, a little something there, it's a fraud. You know, the little, little things are making it jump around all the time. And so is that a good model? Um, lots of things are normally distributed. Uh, I, I just want to preface the next few things I say by saying this is an extremely important model. Uh, some things are well described by it. That's a graph of the height of American women in their 30s. Uh, it seems to me you could say that the, the normal distribution, the bell curve, absolutely nails the data in that case. Uh, this doesn't prove that lots of little small effects bumping into your height is where your height comes from, but it's, it's consistent with that picture. Uh, so Bachelier wrote this, and uh, this, is, this is my demotivational talk for graduate students. He wrote this, it was his PhD thesis, and everyone hated it. It was ignored by economists who didn't like it. It was ignored by physicists who didn't like it. He barely got a teaching job at a third-rate provincial university and never did anything that anyone heard of again. So. There, there's still time to switch into driving for Uber and writing your novel. Uh, but uh, long after this, in the 1950s, after he was gone, I believe, uh, Paul Samuelson rediscovered this and thought this was pretty nifty theory and made it into a cornerstone of modern financial theory. Unlike a lot of the abstractions that I and many have found annoying in economics that can't really be tested, this is a theory that can be tested. So Ian Bachelier certainly gets credit for saying, you know, do stock prices follow this kind of normal distribution? So <clears throat> that's what science is supposed to do, is uh, have testable theories. And you go out and test them with the data. And the bad news is it's been tested, and it's absolutely wrong. Uh, so here is my 64 years of S&P 500 daily data. We're looking at the percentage change each day, not corrected for inflation, just the raw percentage change each day. And you can calculate the mean and the standard deviation. Here's, here's the data, the frequency of each size change. And there's a normal distribution with the same mean and standard deviation. Uh, it may not be completely obvious to you that this is a bad fit, but it actually is. There's way too many points right in the middle. These you know, days of almost no percentage change are too common. The shoulder areas of medium-sized change are a little too uncommon. And what's really interesting for where I'm going with this is that the extremes are much more common in the data than the normal distribution would suggest. To show this, I took the bottom slice of this graph, just picture slicing it there, and stretched the vertical axis by a factor of 100. So this is just a blow up of the bottom slice of that graph. And there you can see that you get, get past 4% and there should be essentially zero chance on the normal distribution of anything past 4%. That's basically four standard deviations. The, coincidentally, the standard deviation is just about 1%. And there's way too many out here in these tails. The worst day. October 19th, 1987, is um, about there. It's a 20% loss in one day. If you thought that the stock market was efficiently representing the value of the stock, then you have to explain why in that day corporate America lost 20% of its value overnight, uh, regaining it over the following days. Um, so the question which this raises, uh, not to go too much farther into this, is our, our relatively extreme events, which we can think of as like an 8% change, you know, uh, something that got out to 8% up or down on this graph, are those trillions of times less likely than a 1% event or just hundreds? Uh, that to me is the measure of this. Uh, the normal distribution says that the 8% days are, should be literally trillions of times less common. And the, uh, the pattern that they seem to fit says that they're actually only hundreds of times less common. Uh, so here, here's the one and only equation. Uh, are these stories you lose half the readers for every equation. So I'm only losing one half here. Uh, the, you draw, take the absolute value of the price changes, and you get this power law relationship, which is 
a straight line on a log log graph. And over there, you've got a good fit for the data. And here's that point that didn't fit in before, that 20% uh, loss sitting out there, almost on this line. Uh, this is, implies a very non-normal distribution. So um, what's the chance of being more than 4% change in one day in this 64 years of daily data? If it was normally distributed, there'd be one such day. In fact, there were 85. Uh, what's the chance of an 8% day? If it was normally distributed, you would have 10 to the minus 11th, one chance in 100 billion of seeing even one. In fact, you saw eight. So um, my sense is that if things were normally distributed and these eight percentage point, eight standard deviation events were trillions of times less likely than common events, it would be safe to ignore them. If they're hundreds of times less likely, they're in the zone of the house fire, or death of a young parent, uh, kind of things that people worry about and ensure themselves about. So um, there's not as much data for doing this with climate data, but I gave it a try. Um, how unusual an event was the European heat wave in 2003, which you know, nobody was prepared for. Tens of thousands of people died. Um, the data for Switzerland, which not the hottest place, but the place with the best data about this, said that the summer temperature was 5.4 standard deviations above the mean temperature for the last century plus. So um, in a normal distribution, which most people assume that if the climate was not changing, temperatures, temperatures wouldn't be constant, but they'd be normally distributed. So this is what a 5.4 standard deviation event looks like next to a normal distribution. Uh, if it's an annual data, it happens once every 30 million years. In fact, it didn't wait 30 million years. A roughly similar heat wave happened seven years later. Um, so it's, it seems, and that's, I believe, people wearing air masks to deal with the, uh, the smoke from uh, wildfires around Moscow uh, during the second one of these. Um, if it's happening every seven years instead of every 30 million years, the data isn't normally distributed. Something is changing. Um, there's other odd bits of evidence of these same kind of very non-normal distribution in extreme weather data. So both the size and the intensity of hurricanes appear to have a distribution like the stock market distribution, not like the normal distribution. Uh, no real theories about why, but that's what the data looks like. So um, there's a long section in the middle of the book, which I'm not going to talk much about, about what are the causes of these events, which are clearly different in climate and in finance, but there's something similar, these, these kinds of extremes. So in, in nature, in climate change, we, I think, have become familiar with the idea of tipping points, of these sudden transitions to a perhaps worse regime that uh, is semi-permanent, hard to get away from. What happened with that younger Dryas story is probably that as the glaciers melted, there was a huge lake formed in central Canada, and the ice dam holding it back broke, dumping this stupendous quantity of cold, fresh water into the North Atlantic and turning off the Gulf Stream, uh, which nature comes back. You know, it took about 1,000 years for the Gulf Stream to come back, but that's, you know, that's as long as forever in terms of you can't turn off human society for 1,000 years and wait for the climate to come back. Um, in finance, I mean, this I did get fascinated with learning about finance at this late point in my career. And uh, there turned out to be two entirely separate stories, either of which could explain the kind of extremes we have. One is about this dance of interactions between noise traders who follow the trends and value traders who look for the values and how they influence each other and change strategies. It's an interesting, complicated behavioral economic story. And the other one is just about the size of people in the market the trading among very unequal sized uh, participants leads to these uh, you know, very non-normal uh, kind of distribution of events. And 
I did find one little physics article, which I cite in there, about Brownian motion among unequal sized particles. And if the particles are sufficiently unequal, you get a very different from normal distribution. And if we're looking at the stock market as an analog to particles bouncing off of each other, um, well, here, here's a true story. On at least one occasion, the value of my retirement assets was affected by something that Warren Buffett had just done in the market. Uh, it's absolutely safe to assume that Warren Buffett has never felt the effects of anything that I've done in the market. <laughs> so, uh, so there you have Brownian in motion among unequal uh, particles. Um, it, it's a challenge writing about climate change when I've written about it, plenty of people have written about it, that, you know, how can you say something new that, uh, you know, breaks through? But anyway, here, here's one attempt which I made. Several years ago, I proposed a name for a new climate economics model, which would have had the acronym ACDC. Cooler heads prevailed as my colleagues insisted that many people would either not recognize or not appreciate references to heavy metal bands. Nonetheless, the ACDC model would have allowed one improvement in the jargon of climate change. The scenario of policy inaction leading to a steadily worsening climate, blandly referred to as the reference case or business as usual in many models, could have been named for the band's 1979 album, Highway to Hell. The title song offers one metaphor hinting at the problem of irreversibility, a season ticket on a one-way ride. Unfortunately, the song's relevant insights end there. The lyrics extol an adolescent vision of hell as daring to be bad enough to associate with unwholesome characters your mother warned you against, such as rock stars with their depraved lifestyles. Shortly after Highway to Hell was released, the lead singer for ACDC drank himself to death, so your mother may have been onto something. <laughs> Our society to date is daring to be bad enough to ignore risks that the scientific community has warned us against. In the absence of sensible climate policies, we have bought our season ticket. We are traveling that highway on a one-way ride toward ever higher temperatures. The tipping points at which irreversible losses occur are scattered along the road, some farther ahead than others. One form of uncertainty concerns the threshold for particular tipping points. How far down the highway is each potential disaster located? Another uncertainty involves the speed at which the world is warming. How fast are we moving on our satanic road trip? We are driving into a fog without a working speedometer. So um, anyway, I could tell stories about climate change and finance, actually, for a long time. But let's, let's turn to the, the policy implications uh, and what this all means. I've been writing about what's wrong with cost-benefit analysis for quite a while, even longer than I've been writing about climate change. Some of you know. Uh, but I have wanted to try to move on. Uh, who knows what they're doing now, but uh, back when the government was run by grown-ups and uh, someday when it will be again, uh, the federal government required comparisons of the costs and benefits of major regulations as part of the decision-making process. Uh, this would be great if you had the numbers, but it actually doesn't work for lots of reasons. And so I've divided here the old problems, which is to say I've written about them before and I'm trying to move on, and the new problems which are related to this book. So the old problems, there's an asymmetry. We often have complete costs and partial benefit estimates, and there's no particular status to weighing complete costs against partial benefits. There are ethical problems of pricing priceless values. What's a human life worth? Saving human lives is one of the principal benefits of a lot of regulations, so you can't escape the question you also, I think, can't give a meaningful, non-embarrassing answer to it. So, uh, and there's a simple, not to say simplistic, economics that goes on where externalities are valued at zero by default unless you go through a long, expensive, painful process of trying to prove that you have the exact right value for an externality. So again, I, uh, I can offer some other books if you want to hear more about that. The new problems related to this are that uh, cost-benefit analysis, when you're looking at an uncertain outcome, almost certainly requires an average or an expected value of the outcome, which doesn't leave much room. On, on average, you're not having a fire. On average, you don't need your fire insurance or your life insurance. You plug that into cost-benefit analysis, you'll get the wrong answer. Uh, 
Meaningful numbers are not always available for all kinds of reasons, but if all you have is a calculator, everything looks like a number. So uh, in attempting to figure out an average risk, you come to the question, how large is a typical crisis? Right? If you, what's the average crisis look like? Um, you have to put something in. You know, if you want to do a cost-benefit analysis, what's the average financial crisis? What's the average climate crisis look like? Uh, the size of these crises is uncertain, partly just mathematical terms. It, that power law distribution that I mentioned implies that either that the average doesn't exist, depending on the exponent, or that the variation around the average is absurdly large. The variance is undefined or infinite for those who like that sort of thing. But you need an average. You've got to put a number in. Uh, can you calculate a weighted average across all the scenarios? You know, look at the range of possible outcomes, figure out how bad they are, and weight their badness by the probability that they're going to occur. Well, that works very well if those probabilities were normally distributed. We're back to the same problem where the normal distribution says you can more or less ignore things that are more than four standard deviations out. And since we know we can't, this uh, weighted average isn't going to work very well. Um, and you know, what if the catastrophic possibilities have only moderately low probabilities of occurring? This is not to say that catastrophe is the most likely thing. It's just to say that it, it's only hundreds of times less likely, not trillions of times less likely. And the, the problem which that leads to was uh, developed in this nice formalism for climate change by Martin Weissman and what he called the dismal theorem behind a lot of um, you know, high octane mathematics. What he was basically saying there is take that weighted average as you look out to more and more catastrophic scenarios, the probability doesn't go down hardly at all. We don't know enough to constrain the probabilities of these absolutely worst cases. Since we can't rule them out with sufficient probability, the, the average, the marginal benefit of reducing emissions and reducing climate risk is literally infinite. This is a conclusion which neither Weitzman nor anyone else could figure out what to do with, but it blows a hole in any cost-benefit analysis, which is based on comparing finite numbers. So, uh, so here's the, the mystery of the bond market. Uh, more neat things I learned about finance in the course of working on this. And the, the riddle here is, why does anyone buy government bonds? You know, you've probably heard this popular to buy government bonds. If you have retirement funds or any kind of savings, you may have had people urge you to buy them. The, the yields are lousy. You know, why, why are you spending your money on something that has such bad yields? Uh, the average rate of return over any long period of time is hugely greater with a balanced portfolio of stocks. People sometimes estimate six percentage points higher. Um, and, you know, if you look at a 20-year investment, the 20th century history is very clear. Stocks do better as a 20-year investment 90% of the time, and they, they make much more money in those 90 but the 10% when bonds do better, they do barely better. So there's a huge payoff in almost all the time to long-term investments in stocks. People continue to buy government bonds. Um, acting as if they're insanely risk averse, more risk averse than anyone believes that they are based on most other kinds of evidence. So this is called the equity premium puzzle, where equity means stocks, not anything about equality. Uh, it's published in 1985 in a story I can particularly identify with. They apparently started submitting it six years earlier and got rejected by journals for six years until they got into a respectable one. And it's been debated off and on for 30 plus years without coming to an absolute conclusion about it. But it is a problem that people who aren't insanely risk averse about most things continue to buy government bonds. Uh, and so as we think about extreme risks, this seemed to me like a window into the problem of extreme risk. How, how do we make sense of how people think about risks and insurance and why do they buy bonds? Uh, there are at least three theories that I came across that have, I think, a moral about how we think about risk and that actually also have analogs in climate change. 
there, there are many more theories than this, but some of them are just extremely technical, and I couldn't come up with a simple story about them. This is an active debate. I mean, the principal contributions were written a while ago, but there's nothing like a consensus about which one is right. So one is that there's an extra risk aversion for catastrophic losses, that people are sort of normally risk averse for normal risks, and then for the humongous risks, the once in a lifetime events, 1929, 2008, you know, when everything goes to hell and you lose gigantic amounts of money, there's extra you know, overdrive risk aversion for those years. And that turns out to explain this odd pattern of people continuing to buy low yield government bonds. Um, the second one, I hesitate to try to explain without blackboard equations and so on, but the conventional <coughs> theories of risk and uh, utility end up creating a perverse connection between how you think about short-term risks and how you think about very long-term risks. So you have to, if you care more about one, you care less about the other. Just as a, a mathematical accident, I think, in the traditional theory, not anything that was intentional or useful, but it, you know, it lived on because it was convenient in mathematics and most of the economics isn't in empirical science and so on. Um, if you separate the views of current losses and long-term future risks and allow them to be sensibly set separately, the problem goes away. And th this is actually where I entered this story, that I was working with someone who uh, had retired from Goldman Sachs and become a uh, climate advocate who felt that this was a crucial problem and that this particular solution to the equity premium pro puzzle had remarkable implications as an analog for, uh, <coughs> for climate economics. The third theory, which is actually easier to explain, as, as kind of a cute one, is that what, what's the behavioral economics of loss? So we know that people value small losses as being worse than small gains. You know, lose $10 feels worse, than, feels more bad than gain $10 feels good. Uh, you give a group of college students, you know, give half their students a mug and half of them, uh, you know, cash roughly equal in value to the mug and ask them to buy and sell. And the ones who were given the mug are only willing to sell them at twice what the ones who were given cash are willing to pay for them. They're just, you know, a, a trivial object randomly distributed people. So, you know, if small loss, suppose that small losses feel twice as bad as equivalent small gains feel good, which seems to be one of the things that comes out of behavioral economics. Now, the problem with the 20-year stock investment is that it would be way too easy to change. It's way too easy to look up what it's worth this year and to imagine yourself changing it. And so instead of this 20-year investment, if it could be locked up and you could be prevented from knowing anything about it, then it would be a great uh, secure investment. But the process of thinking about it and thinking how easy it would be to sell stocks and buy bonds and vice versa essentially converts the psychology of a safe 20-year investment into a series of 20 much less safe one-year investments. In one year, you can definitely lose money buying stocks instead of bonds. One-third of the time on a one-year basis, bonds are a better investment. So the possibility of change puts you into this world. The more often you look at what stocks are worth, the worse you're going to feel about them because they do go up and down all the time. And it goes up, you feel a little better. It goes down, you feel twice as bad. So the more often you check, the worse you feel. So uh, this theory comes with this charming take-home message, which is to feel better about your retirement or other savings, don't look at what they're worth. You know, check less often. Uh, even checking once a year seems to be enough to uh, do this. Well. Each of these theories has an exact analog in climate change, and each of them implies, just as investors look relatively risk averse uh, in buying government bonds, that the analogous economic theory of climate change says that we should be taking much more precautionary policies, moving much faster to reduce emissions. Uh, it's, uh, you can choose any one of those three and get that answer. Um, this is starting to sound something like the precautionary principle, 
some of you will remember the debates in the 1990s uh, that brought the precautionary principle to the fore. It, American environmentalists have liked it. In Europe, it's come much closer to being part of government policy to take a precautionary approach. And in the original formulations, uh, which may have lost something in translation from German, but uh, not quite sure, but it, it essentially said that we should respond to any serious threats of harm without waiting for proof. And there are lots of good stories about this. Uh, you know, people suspected that smoking was killing you decades before there was hard proof. Uh, the first really good medical description of what asbestos does to your lungs was published uh, many decades before the problem was realized. Uh, it was published by a woman who did not have a medical degree, so there were two reasons to ignore her. So, uh, uh, but she was right about what it did to your lungs. Um, but the, the critics, Cass Sunstein, people like that, or legal scholars who like cost-benefit analysis, point out that if we respond to every threat that hoves into view, no matter how small, that we will spend ourselves poor worrying about these threats, which you know, in some level is probably true. And so here I think the numbers matter. It's just that we should be looking at things further out the curve, you know, that the uh, you know, the hundreds of times less likely is worth paying attention to, trillions of times is not. Um, or another example of this is I actually looked up how often are homes damaged by meteorites. This is a perfectly real phenomenon. There's no particular scientific dispute about whether meteorites can ever damage a house. Uh, but it's five orders of magnitude less likely than a fire. Uh, it's, uh, it's in the millionths of a percent per year, not in the tenths of a percent. So I, I think that if meteorite insurance were sold separately, a rational, reasonably precautionary person would you know, buy fire insurance and ignore meteorite insurance. I, I think it's too far out the curve to worry about that tenths of a, tenths of a percent per year is a, is a real risk you can't ignore. And it is just under one case per year of meteorite damage in all of North America. So take your chances. Uh, it's, uh, your family have to live many, many, many generations before having a chance of that. Um, so there's a wonderful economic theory that deserves more attention that uh, Kenneth Arrow and Leonid Hurwitz, uh, both won Nobel Prizes for other work they did in economics, wrote about what they called the economics of ignorance. What they meant by ignorance was a situation where you know the possibilities that could happen, but you know literally nothing about the probabilities. And they did one of these uh, sort of strange symbolic logic uh, kind of arguments about uh, what could we deduce about this and deduce that if you literally know nothing about the probabilities, then the optimal policy that you can make depends only on the best and worst case outcome. You can ignore everything in the middle. You can certainly ignore the idea of taking averages of any kind uh, because in averaging all the possibilities is like saying you know they're all equally likely, which is not what they meant by ignorance, that you know nothing about it. What if one side in a debate has financed many independent ex experts who've all come up with roughly the same answer, then averaging just privileges them. Um, and so later work has shown that actually if we're really risk averse, only the worst case really matters. If, if you're really worried about how badly things could turn out, that you should base policy on the credible worst case. Some, this was buried somewhere by Arrow and Hurwitz and rediscovered in the 90s, I think, by environmental economists who cast it as the expert panel problem. Uh, you assemble a panel of experts who are known to be qualified experts on the subject and use their worst case prediction. So this does not solve the problem of the politics of choice and of what to worry about. It just makes it one step less impossible. Rather than coming up with the perfect forecast, uh, which is impossible, all you have to do is decide who's on the expert panel, which is extremely difficult and politicized. Uh, 
you know, when do the people who doubt climate change or who doubt that tobacco costs lung cancer get kicked off the panel? When do we know enough to say that theirs is no longer a point of view that matters? Uh, was there a way to say that the one Iraqi refugee who claimed detailed knowledge of the non-existent weapons of mass destruction in uh, 2001 didn't belong on the expert panel advising U.S. policy? Uh, there was just one. They were a little suspicious of him. His code name was Curveball. So, but uh, he was, uh, you know, if you, the, the literal precautionary principle would say, oh, that's a risk. Uh, and the, the question of could, is there a ground for ruling him out? Uh, thinking about expert panels reminds me of the time that I was on an EPA science advisory board panel for about three hours until the senior people returned to the office and discovered what the junior people had done in their absence. Uh, the senior people were more in tune with the pro-industry vibe of EPA's decision-making about pesticides, which this was going to be about. Uh, so anyway, uh, this doesn't produce a nailed-down answer, but it gets us a step closer, I think. Uh, so the last step in this journey here, um, as we move farther and farther away from quantification, um, I always wanted to write an article called Who Won World War II? Uh, and I, it's the last chapter in the book before the conclusions. You can see it. it would, where the, the point of the title is not that anyone's in doubt about the military outcome, but that in economic terms, the answer is probably Soviet central planning. Uh, the, the, most of the war material used to defeat Germany, as well as most of the fighting, was done by the Soviet Union and central planning was as efficient at that as it was inefficient at peacetime. Uh, you know, if, if there is one extreme event which is so extreme, you know, the, the Germans are invading uh, and about to take over your country, um, you know, all of a sudden the efficiency of the market, which is very much based on balancing consumer choice, where we, now we're in an environment where we don't really care about consumer choice. You know, the market does a brilliant job of getting the right mix of restaurants, the right mix of stylish clothes that people want to buy and so on. But, you know, when there's an existential threat, we're suddenly losing interest in where you want to eat dinner. Um, and uh, turning it over to a bunch of capable engineers is often a good answer. An uh, another problem with exactly the same feeling to it is Cuba's efforts to protect against hurricanes. Cuba is, you know, sort of mediocre macroeconomic performance, uh, central planning lived on there longer than elsewhere, but what they're really good at is hurricane preparation. That they, uh, they have a national forecaster who goes on the air and tells people about the expected storm tracks, which they're in the Caribbean, everyone is very interested in expected storm tracks. And uh, they plan for these massive evacuations. Uh, most people evacuate to friends and families, they're big shelters. Every motor vehicle on the island can be commandeered to drive people to shelter. And they have almost nobody die in big hurricanes. They estimate that their death rate is 15 times lower than the US for comparable hurricanes. Uh, so when you're faced with that kind of extreme, you know, whether you're defending against hurricanes or Hitler, uh, you know, when there's a Category 5 hurricane coming here in the Caribbean, we're also not so interested in where you want to eat dinner. I mean, that, the things that the market is efficient at start to fade away. So I thought that this was going to have this sort of conclusion that uh, this was the way to think about climate change and financial crisis, and we should all mobilize behind it. And this is like, I, I suddenly felt this empathy with novelists who say they create a character, and the character goes somewhere that they hadn't expected. Because as I worked on this, it, it was just harder and harder to come out with that conclusion. Uh, you know, there are a lot of people who talk about things as if they were a crisis. There's even a school of psychology that talks about what they call the sacred values approach to policy making, where people act as if one or another policy goal is sacred, possibly from a religion, possibly you know secular, but with the same emotional intensity, the same absolute meaning as a religious tenet would have. And, you know, think about the abortion reproductive rights debates. You know, nobody is interested in a cost-benefit analysis, really. That's, uh, you know, these are things that are 
you know, absolute questions of morality for a lot of people on both sides in that case. Um, this is an important argument, but it's easily overused or trivialized. You know, are farm subsidies crucial to our way of life without which we wouldn't be the nation that we are? You know, and that many such arguments are made up. Uh, the interstate highway system was not justified because uh, one needed sensible transportation. It was justified because what if we needed to move uh, the army quickly around the country if we were invaded? Um, well, we did need transportation and we weren't invaded. So, uh, and you have the extreme of it now, I think, uh, you know, government by Twitter, right? It's, it's always a dark and stormy night. Uh, and uh, you are always facing an absolute moral crisis and you see, you know, the final downfall of this argument, which was so incredibly meaningful in these original cases, but that the sort of, which is easier, to do a careful cost-benefit analysis or to declare that you're defending against a crisis that threatens our way of life? Well, yeah, that's what everybody else thought, too. Uh, was that, uh, why not tell a story about crisis? I mean, uh, this book doesn't talk a lot about specific policy recommendations. I take it as obvious that financial markets should be regulated so they don't destroy people's savings and home ownership and livelihoods. And, uh, you know, if you, um, if climate change, um, you know, of course we don't want to keep going down the highway to hell. And, um, uh, you know, some, some economists I suggest in the book actually think it's only the highway to heck and it uh, seems to not look as serious to them. But um, another wonderful quote from Keynes was when he said that in a good society, economists would become like dentists. They'd be apolitical technicians who everybody needed, but they would never be the deciders who told you what it was that society needed to do, calculating optimal goals and telling you why that was what you preferred. Uh, so um, how are we doing on time? Can I read one more? Go ahead. Okay. What Yeah, yeah. No, you have to. Uh, th this is... Uh, I thought a inspiring example of describing making public policy without these calculations, with, without careful risks. Uh, talking about the environment. Shall we surrender to our surroundings or shall we make our peace with nature and begin to make reparation for the damage we have done to our air, to our land, and to our water? Clean air, clean water, open spaces, these should once again be the birthright of every American. If we act now, they can be. The price tag on pollution control is high. Through our years of past carelessness, we incurred a debt to nature, and now that debt is being called. <coughs> we can no longer afford to consider air and water com common property free to be abused by anyone without regard to the consequences. This requires comprehensive new regulations. It also requires that to the extent possible, the price of goods should be made to include the cost of producing and disposing of them without damage to the environment. Who knows what Roxanne that was from? Anybody? That is from the uh, 1970 State of the Union address by Richard Nixon. Uh, <coughs> and so, as I said, at the very end of the book, if Richard Nixon, for all his sins, could do that, surely we can do even better. And. Uh, Uh, on the web can uh, can hear him. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you to uh, to use the microphone. I uh, see some hands up, but we always uh, always call on students first here. But we'll, but I'm I'm, no I'm noting that your hand hands up. And uh, since we're anyway, we're just getting to know each other. Uh, introduce yourself so we can all get to know each other. And I'll just just pass it around, and I'll let Frank take it from there. Sure. My name is uh, Anna Pantelic, and I'm actually a BU alumna from. Oh. Uh, Ten years ago, I guess. Um, but uh, it was a really interesting talk, um, and you know, it's it's a it's a fascinating analysis and comparison. And I really like uh, thinking about sort of the um, hard sciences approach to economics and 
sort of the more fluffy social sciences that they sometimes say. But I was curious if you're, in your research um, you did any sort of analysis as to how financial markets sort of reacted um, during extreme events, uh, climate events. Has there been any sort of a correlation? Do we see any sort of immediate effect? Because that might be an interesting way of, um, you know, thinking about policy. I was just wondering if you happen to have done any analysis on I that. I have not. Okay. It's an interesting idea, but I, I don't know. Of. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, that's a good idea. Hi, I'm Mikael Munoz. I'm a research fellow here. My question is about the insurance analogy and about insurance in general. Yeah. So the house has a chance, so you say we should buy price insur uh, fire insurance, and I say at what price? Because if you have a 0.1% chance of losing the house, but they're charging me 3% of the value of the house for insurance, does it still make sense? And it is my idea like, to climate change insurance because no one knows how to value. You're being charged for worst case scenario with a distribution of probability, therefore you're pay you may be paying way more even if you are able to insure. So it, does it really make sense to insure in all cases? And then how do you insure against systemic risk, considering that all the insurance providers are part of the system, which are likely to be impacted if there's an event? Thank you. Uh, I'm Rich Rosen. I used to work with Frank. Um, so that last question feeds exactly into mine and, and one of your slides. C could you go back to the one that said, but on the cost, I think it was the next to the last slide. Can you go back? Okay, no. The, the next to the last. The other way. <laughs> to the end. Oh, to the end? Oh, sorry. Okay, so where it says change may not be costly, okay? Financial yeah. markets should be regulated, climate change should be stopped. Yeah. So that relates to insuring, I think, against climate change, looking at costs and yeah. benefits. So the question I was going to ask is, it isn't a key point that even though we don't know exactly, certainly, what the costs of, of mitigating or preventing climate change would be, as you and I know, a lot of studies show you might even come out ahead on the yep. economics. Uh, so we wouldn't be spending ourselves into poverty like uh, Cass Sunstein uh, seems to think. So if the, if the uncertainty and range of possible costs is fairly narrow for preventing climate change, and yet the range of the damage might result from climate change in the long run is very wide and uncertain yep. and potentially catastrophic. Wouldn't that argue in favor of preventing it? Uh, sure. Shall I um, talk about um, So in terms of the limits of the insurance analogy, I, I think that's absolutely right. Insurance takes you a ways into it and highlights the fact that <clears throat> things a ways out the curve are quite interesting and averages are not so interesting. But there is, uh, th for fire insurance and for life insurance, your insurance company knows exactly what the probabilities are and so they can uh, set premiums meaningfully. For these kind of extreme risks where you're uncertain about the tail of the curve, that's right, there's, there may be no way to do that. And if insurance is too expensive, my aunt and uncle lived in St. Croix in the Virgin Islands for uh, many years. And after some hurricane that ripped up the island, the insurance to insure your house against hurricane damage has got to be, uh, it was a while ago, but I think it would be probably the equivalent of 10,000 a year uh, in today's dollars. And they said at that point, a lot of their neighbors concluded that it was better to spend 10,000 a year reinforcing your roof uh, rather than 10,000 a year down the drain to the insurance company. So that sort of collective self-insurance, it has the same characteristic that if there isn't going to be a hurricane, that's $10,000 out of your pocket. But it, you know, if there is going to be a hurricane, it's uh, preparation, self-insurance. So certainly the public analogy has to be collective self-insurance. We essentially metaphorically reinforcing the roof over everybody's house. I mean, there, for planetary problems, there's no solution. There, you know, there's no galactic insurance company that will give us a loaner planet to use while ours is towed back for repairs. Right? I mean, it's not. <laughs> it's not a possibility. Uh, so, uh, so yes, we are talking about 
collective self-insurance against uncertain risks, which makes it harder than that, that opening picture suggested. Uh, in terms of Rich's question, a point which I mentioned on the slide here but didn't talk about, uh, is that, yes, the, the notion that environmental protection or financial regulation is expensive, that it's always expensive and that we always have to think about costs and benefits comes from the idea, you know, back in that idealized economics I was talking about at the beginning, the notion that somehow we're at an optimum where every resource is being used to its most efficient, most desirable use already has crept back in there. And so if you are already using everything as efficiently as possible, anything new you do is making someone worse off, right? If you start at the top of the mountain, there's nowhere to go but down. Um, and so the, uh, <clears throat> a number of people have started to point out that we know that the economy is far from using everything efficiently. There are people who are underemployed. Uh, there are resources that are underemployed. There are power plants running that cost much more than cleaner alternatives would cost uh, in the United States and elsewhere. Uh, so that forcing people to change might actually not deprive anybody of resources that were being used efficiently before. They'll deprive someone of personal profits, but they will not necessarily make society worse off. They might force society to use resources more efficiently. Uh, and so that that's, uh, that presumption that every change, every regulation has a net cost comes from the assumption that we were already doing everything as well as possible. Since we aren't already doing everything as well as possible, uh, everyone who looks at energy scenarios comes up with all kinds of things you can do at very low cost to reduce emissions. I'm not sure they get you all the way there, but they get you one exciting giant step along the road. <laughs> well, uh, oh, go ahead. Can well, we get like now we don't want to keep everybody from cookies, I guess. But um, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to frame this. I mean, I think they really want to read the book because I, I obviously, so, and, and in this shorter period of time, there you go. there's a lot um, that you can't cover. I, I guess my question to you would be: What do you think, after doing all this? is the key value, the key contribution of linking these two uh, worst case scenarios, right? Or worst case uh, economics in terms of climate change and finance. And, and you certainly already given us some clues in there in terms of the different kinds of paradigms in which these two different uh, cases can be viewed and whether there are parallels between them. Um, but is there new out of this? Um, really, for the first two-thirds of the book, the stories are somewhat separate. When I talk about how economics has misunderstood these things in the past, and then particularly when I talk about the specific causes of crises, they're fairly separate. It's in the last third of the book talking about policy responses and how to think about policy responses that the abstract similarity the non-normal distribution, the extreme tail risks, uh, leads to very similar policy questions. And so it's that I think that they start to speak to each other uh, much more effectively in the last part where you talk about how, how should we think about public policy in an era of fat tails and uh, extreme risks uh, that has a lot of similarities. I looked around for other connections and this could be sort of like your question also was that um, I did discover one interesting economic history article that said between about 1870 and 1920 or so that the U.S. economy was tied more than before or after to cotton exports, which were in fact tied to the weather, so that you had uh, more weather-dependent Cycle, economic cycles in the U.S. that the 
there was this signal of changing weather, which affected cotton harvests, which affected exports, was stronger than either before or after. I mean, that, you know, if we end up with bad enough economic times to make enough of a mess out of agriculture in the future, we could perhaps recreate that kind of unfortunately tight connection. But I, right now, right now the analyses are relatively separate. Um, Um, Cynthia Barraquette from the Party Center. So, somewhat related, I think, is that there are times when, you know, one catastrophe is, it will tell you that there's a very high probability of another one shortly to follow. So, thinking about the fires in California this yeah. year, for example. I mean, after the fires in December, the handwriting was pretty much on the wall that if it was going to be a really rainy season, the mudslides were going to come. Yep. So how does that factor in um, to all of this? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, the consequences of those fires, I guess, are greater than the actual fire itself. I think that the the distribution of extreme events makes it really hard to predict. I mean, as I said, there is no typical crisis, uh, and there, there's no uh, there's no easy way to predict exactly how bad things will be. That uh, you know, all sizes of crises come out of more or less the same underlying causes. Again, clearer in finance, where you have so much data, the same. Groundhog Day stories happening over and over again, uh, but that you can predict that there will be crises. You can't predict exactly when or exactly how large the next one will be, um, and I, I think that that's a little bit like that. You get. Uh, I've just lately been taken with reading a couple historians who've written about what happened when there was a temporary cold spell, one in about the 17th century and one about. 1816, the year without a summer after the huge volcano in 1815, and it made a mess out of all kinds of things, not in a way which I think anyone could have predicted. You know, a few degrees Celsius of temperature change blows up harvests, and that blows up one thing and another about society uh, in ways that, I mean, I, I think it's again the limits of quantification of these damages. That you can tell that, I, I just wrote a little blog piece about that that you can find on the web, which I called our climate damage is immeasurably bad. Uh, we know that it's bad and we know that we don't know how to measure exactly how bad it is. And that's where the <coughs> worst case decision making kind of questions come in as an alternative to anything that looks like cost benefit analysis. Before we wrap up, let me just say about selling the book, I sort of lost the argument with the publisher about the price, so they put it out at a uh, cover price of $49. I think Amazon will now give it to you for $44. Uh, I, two things I can say. One is shop around. Uh, last night I found Target, who apparently wants to be an online bookseller, was selling it much cheaper than Amazon or Barnes & Noble. The other thing is that I'm selling them here today for $30. Uh, so, which is uh, a huge discount from uh, anything else you find, uh, cash or check only. I don't take credit cards and I don't do payment apps. So. There you go. Free cookies, free coffee, and thirty dollar books. Frank Ashley, thanks for coming. Thank you.